This is Bruce. You want to treat Bruce? Tony is over here. He might join us. No, he's going to take a snooze over there on the couch. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, this is their roadmap to success. Uh, basically, they're both rescue dogs and had some uh, some issues before they got uh, into this great house. And he's a little bit nervous, and I think the guardians unintentionally were enhancing the nervousness by petting the dogs when they're uh, in an unbalanced state of mind, which is a very common mistake a lot of people make. And so just knowing not to do that will help ex accelerate the process because we're not going to continue contributing to what was making them nervous. Now, there are other things that are making them nervous as well that we went over off camera. Uh, we're going to talk about some of those in this video. So to help the dogs uh, st uh, start getting petted uh, more, more appropriately, I went over petting with a purpose, which is simply asking the dog to sit or lay down or do something before we pet it if it initiates contact. So if he comes up and sticks his nose under my arm and nudges me, he's, or scratches at me or jumps on me, he's telling me what to do. So that's contributed to him thinking that the world, he's in charge of the world. We don't understand the humans are in charge. You don't have to worry about it. We're, remove the burden of responsibility. So if he nudges me, instead of petting him for doing what he told me to do, I'm gonna give him a counter order, tell him to sit. When he sits, I like to pet him under his chin to facilitate a nose up orientation. When a dog feels good, its nose is up or parallel to the ground. If you pat a dog on top of the head like this, you see the nose going down. That's something that insecure dogs do. So whenever we're petting him for, with a purpose or for passive training, we always want to pet him under the chin. Now, if, if, if his butt is here, his head is here, I can scratch his butt too. We just don't ever want to pat on top of the head. But whenever possible, try to go out of your way to do it under the chin. And say just the command word. So if he sits, I pet him and say sit. If he lays down, I pet him and say crash or whatever the word is. Don't say good crash or good boy Bruce, just sit, crash, whatever it is. Yeah, I'm telling him. Um, all right, so um, that's uh, uh, petting with a purpose. Uh, now, if we come in the room, we see someone's petting the dog and, and the dog is standing, we say, ah, paycheck. Paycheck just means I think you may have forgotten to pet with a purpose. The person stops petting, we tell the dog to sit, and then we pet, and then we say, David told me I could pet after he sit, uh, sit you know, even if he stands up after I make him do it first. And he, as soon as you heard the close the door, he stood up and I continued petting him. David said, it's okay. So they just have to change their state or prepay for it. So if he comes over to me and sits down in front of me, that's a polite way of saying I'd like your attention. I want to make sure I recognize and appreciate that because otherwise he's going to go back to scratching or reward, uh, doing the other things that got him attention. So basically, every time that uh, the dog prepays, I'm going to reach over and pet them. And that's what leads me to what I call passive training. Passive training is simply narrating whatever the dog happens to be doing. So the dog comes over to you on his own accord. You didn't call him, he did it organically. Just pet him under his chin and say, come. Dog lays down next to you, pet him and say, crash. Sits down, pet him and say, sit. Brings you a special toy, brings me a lobster. I might say lobster every time he brings me the toy of lobster. After a while now I can say lobster and he goes and gets that specific toy for me. So the more that we reward dogs for desired actions and behaviors um, and redirect them into things that are desired, the more they're gonna emulate those moving forward. Uh, and this will help us add a little bit of structure to mealtime or to, uh, to treats and attention, and also it makes it more valuable to him. If he feels like he earned this attention, then he feels a sense of pride, and that will help with his self-esteem issues. Now, he's a little bit more nervous uh, than his buddy over there, and so one of the things I recommend the Guardians do is go to YouTube or Google and search for easy dog tricks. Don't, like I said, don't do the shake, but find some other ones that are really easy to do. Don't do the really hard ones. We might set up a follow-up session to work on a heel, and heel and stay are very difficult. They take a lot of practice. Teach your dog to roll over. Teaching, you know, I have, uh, well, I don't do this. I have a little dog. I, I, instead of doing a shake, I say pound. I hold my hand out, and he, which I think is cute when little dogs reach up to do that. Um, but again, it promotes jumping up, so that's why I wouldn't do the shake or the pound for now. But if you teach him bang, you're dead. Or whatever these are, each time you teach him a new trick, that's going to boost his self-esteem. And if he can get to the point where now he knows 10 different commands, right now he only knows a couple. And so it's hard for him to have much self-esteem. So the more that we teach him, the better he's going to feel about himself. Also, the more engaging he's going to be, we can direct him to do things. That's one of the things we went over in the session is how to create a name for a dog bed. So we have a dog bed over there we're calling Cancun. We just take a treat, toss it on the dog bed. When he goes over there, we say the word. Remember, anytime you're getting a treat, he needs to get the treat in his mouth first and then hear the command word after the treat goes into his mouth. Um, so the first way we do is we toss it on the dog bed, let him go get it, and say the word Cancun. After a while, uh, the other way we do it is we leave one there when he's in the next room and he comes in, he sees the dog treat and he goes and gets it and we say the word Cancun. And if he gets it when you don't see him, that's okay because he's still getting a positive reinforcer. The third way, I might touch his nose with the treat, lead him over under the dog bed, put him in a sit, then pop the treat in his mouth and say Cancun or lay down. Now these are to entice them to go there. After a while, they're going to start going there on their own. When they do, if you don't have any treats, you just say Cancun. You reach over and pet him if you can do that without them getting up. But if we have a treat, we toss a treat. 
So what we want to do is now we're going to reward you for going to Cancun. Now we're doing this in conjunction with taking away their couch because that's one of the rules, uh, part of the structure that we're adding in terms of more discipline. So the dogs see a literal distinction between the humans and the dogs because the, do the humans are up here and the dogs are down there. Um, so the furniture should be no furniture for at least 30 days. And then after that, only for good behavior and with invitation. So if I invite him up and he starts barking, he has to get down. Now I say 30 days or as long as these problems are still going on. So until he's more relaxed, he's not chewing stuff up and we don't have those problems, it might go longer than 30 days. Sometimes it goes 60 days, 90 days. And some people decide, you know, I kind of like not having the dogs on the couch. Now these are little dogs. I'm pretty sure the guardians want to have them mm -hmm. on the furniture. So it's just a short term uh, uh, br uh, break from doing that. Now they do uh, like the dog sleeping with them and they want to continue doing that. So I just said that that should be only with an invitation. And again, for good behavior, on the couch and they start barking, you have to get down. Uh, let me see, another rule, they have to sit before they go through any door. Remember, double the length of the time. Sit, one, two, three. If they don't sit within three seconds, walk away. Wait one minute, then go back and again, tell them to sit. They don't walk, then I walk away this time for two minutes, next time for four minutes, then eight minutes. So I keep on doubling the length of time. And eventually what will happen is the dog will go prepay for that as well, go sit down at the, at the door saying, I want to go outside. Now they're giving us a visual indicator, I want to walk or whatever it is. Now, uh, the dogs are getting a walk a couple times a week, but, uh, and part of the uh, problem is they're, they're, they're not half big fans of the leash. Once they go on a walk though, they're fine. So the video above this one talks about how to create a conditional Walsh response. Try to do that about three or four times a day with each dog. You might want to actually go in different rooms and do this. Um, and so make sure, you, again, prime the clicker a little bit. Throw a couple treats on the ground, click each time they get them. Can you hang out just a little bit more, buddy? I see that lick lipping, but that's only one, so I'm gonna say that you're not too stressed. Lick, lick lipping is a sign of stress. Now, when we're on walk, uh, another thing we went over is the technique to stop dogs from jumping up or getting excited. So we're gonna use that leash stepping on technique. Remember, if, you, if you're by yourself, tether it from, uh, to, from the table, and again, that leash goes right about to where that line was where the wall is. And so I would invite guests to come over, especially people that they're gonna get excited for. Now, if he's the more excited one, I would practice really with him and maybe hold him or put him in the kennel or in the play area or put him in a bedroom. But I would go through your Rolodex and try to uh, set a goal of having two people come and visit a week, even if it's just a neighbor comes over a couple minutes. And again, remember, you're gonna turn sideways right out of the dog's reach. And we're not gonna say a word. As soon as the dog calms down, preferably with a sit, but if their energy calms down quite a bit, then we turn to and start reaching towards them to pet them very slowly. And at any point they start getting excited or get up out of a sit, if we went waited for the sit, then I step back outside of their range of view or uh, access and I turn sideways. And again, I wait again for the dog to sit down on its own or be calm, then I turn and engage. And at first I'm turning and engaging like this. Very slow, I'm talking very softly. But eventually we're gonna start moving a little bit faster, a little bit faster, and then we're gonna go, oh my God, what a cute little doggy! Because you see the response that we get. This way when we meet people on the street and they say that and they act with that high-pitched voice, your dogs know the only way this person is gonna continue petting me is if I keep my four on the floor. And the beauty of this is we don't tell the dog to do anything. We're not micromanaging the dog. We're helping the dog learn a new behavior that is more desirable for us. Now, for these dogs, because they're both a little bit nervous, uh, are they nervous about people on dog, or are they just reactive to dogs on the Reactive to dogs. Okay. So if you see your dog looking at another dog and it turns its head to the side or turns its body away, it's saying, it's tr saying I, wanna move, I don't want to get any closer to that dog. If you continue walking towards the dog when your dog does that, sometimes that elicits the response. So if your dog stops going towards another dog and you see another dog going, see if you can go perpendicular to the dog, walk around a car, walk around something. If you continually, a lot of people put their dogs in jeopardy. So the dog thinks, oh, we're going on a walk, they're gonna throw me in all kinds of dangerous situations. So I have to be in a heightened sense of alert. So we want them to, we want to recognize, if we see another dog, that's why I mentioned the guardian's practicing U-turns. So if you wanna practice the U-turn for no reason whatsoever, so if I've got, and this would be easier if you only have one dog at a time. So maybe you're walking them separately. And what you're doing is if I have the dog on this side, when I get to turn, I kind of crouch down and I hold the treat right in front of me. So he looks at it, as he does this, I kind of lead him as I turn. And once we turn completely, I pop in his mouth, say the word turn, but I take four or five steps this way and I repeat the process. So we're basically walking this way, doing kind of an oval, do another oval, or another turn, and then going back the original direction. So the more, we want to practice again, when out without any dogs or any reason for them to be reactive. If you only do it when you see a dog, then that that uh, triggers a response. Oh, another dog's around, who should I bark at? Uh, and uh, remember, anytime you see a dog that they're reacted to, we want to increase the distance 
and we want to put something to visually block them from doing it. So go around a car or a shrub. Palm trees don't work very well because they're so thin. Uh, but look for a way. And if you have to, just turn around and walk the other direction until you find a driveway or a car, something you can move around. If your dog is trying to, when they bark at the other dogs, they're trying to increase the distance. They don't like that dog being so close. So they're trying to bark to make the other dog move away. Well, we can achieve the same result by turning and walking away ourselves. Now, I think a lot of this is because they think that they are uh, in charge of their humans. So the more that we enforce rules and boundaries consistently and pet with a purpose and eat before we eat them, uh, feed them, uh, another rule would be they shouldn't be within seven feet of anyone's eating. So remember, if anyone's eating in this couch area, they should not be in this little C area. Um, and the more that we enforce those things, the more they uh, gravitate towards the follower position, the less reactive they're going to be on walks. Uh, let me see what else we went over a leadership exercise on the floor if you guys forget how to do that and you would like to practice some more message me and I can share a link where I describe all the ins and outs of that video you can watch somebody else doing it it's really to help you remember the three uh, the four escalating consequences remember hiss before the dog does the wrong thing uh, and, and only one hiss per incident and match the intensity of your hiss to the dog's what energy level and only hiss I mean, if, if he might be more sensitive than Tony so we might have to hiss at him more than we have to hiss for Tony, uh, or at a louder level. But you hiss before the dog does the wrong thing. Once they're barking, the hiss is not the appropriate thing to do. Second thing we do is we stand up abruptly, turn to face the dog, and keep our belly button pointed at the dog until it turns sideways, or until it sits, that's the next step, until it stands stationary, sits, or lies down, or leaves the room. And then I can go back to do what I'm doing. The third cons, or, or uh, no, I'm sorry, as soon as it sits, and we take two steps backwards, pause for one second at the end to say, period, we're done with that conversation. Then I can do my thing. And when you do this, make very deliberate, sudden movements, and then freeze. That, that kind of staggered motion is what show it tells dogs that we're communicating, not just meandering about. The, so the second consequence, stand up abruptly, turn to face the dog until it's stationary, then take two steps backwards, and only two steps, pause one second, and then go back to doing what you're doing. The third consequence is to march directly, deliberately at the dog, wherever the dog goes, until the dog turns sideways or greater. As soon as the dog turns sideways, you stop, keep your feet together, and now you go to the second consequence, you're pivoting until the dog's stationary, sits or lies down, take those two steps backwards, pause again, then go back to doing what you're doing. The only time that wouldn't apply is if the dog's in a designated no dog zone. So let's say the dog's not supposed to be in this area in front of me, and I get up and march at him, he turns sideways right away, but he's still in the designated no dog zone, I keep marching at him until he crosses the line. This is why we establish invisible boundaries and perimeters. The fourth consequence is putting the dog in a leash timeout, stepping on the leash, in his case about two feet away from where it attaches to his harness, in his case about a foot away. And I don't give the dog any directions. As soon as the dog sits, I take my foot that's on the leash and slide it towards him to take the tension off. And I'm not telling him to sit. When he sits, he's saying I'm challenging you less. And then when he lays down, I take my foot off very suddenly off the leash. Because when he lays down, he say, I surrender. And then what we're trying to tell him is help him understand is when he surrenders, good things happen. We're not going to force him to surrender. We're not going to punish him if he doesn't surrender. We're just going to reward him when he does. Again, we only want to utilize positive dog training. Um, at first, you're going to have to hiss. And then, and then after we take our foot off the leash, he gonna, he's going to get up and eventually drag the leash when he walks away. That's dangerous, unsupervised. So never do that unsupervised. But if a minute goes by, he starts barking as he runs by, you step on the leash again. Or if a couple minutes go by, you take the leash off, it's not a quid pro quo. And what we're teaching him is you're, if you're defiant, you lose all freedom, and you return to a completely calm and balanced state of mind, freedom is restored. Um, so, and same thing when we come home from work, we're gonna do the exercise with the leash, but at any time that the dogs get really excited, we're gonna stop doing whatever that thing is and move away from them whenever possible, or remove the object if we can. We want them to understand that overexcitement is not happiness and overexcitement results in the stoppage of things. Just because when dogs are overexcited, that's when they're gonna make the most mistakes. We want them to be calm and balanced. I see that yawn, but I, that's just one. Yawn can be a calming signal or it could be saying, I'm stressed out. So if you see your dog licking its lips, the signs that gonna, your dog's gonna, typically the first thing they're gonna do when they see another dog is they're gonna stare and freeze. That's the first warning. That's when you wanna do your U-turn or increase the distance. If you can do that at that point, they warned, and what they wanted to have happen and more space happened. So they don't have to take it to the next level. Um, licking lips, like I said, sign of stress. This could be, you can approach me. So if you see your dog lift its paw up, like uh, pointing at the other dog, that can mean, hey, you can approach me. And if you're in your home and he lifts up his paw, that's a way of saying please. So it can mean multiple things. Um, I'd like the guardians to start feeding them in a structured way. They're right now fed out of the same bowl. They don't have any problems with it, but just there's no benefit to that. What I do is put food in both bowls in the play area 
And the play area, I would get the vinyl flooring and order another one of those, and like I said, make it completely encased so you don't have to worry about it. Um, so once I put the food in there, they uh, put, uh, I would make them leave the play area, leave the door open, put the food down and stand there blocking it, and then back up away from it. And then when they come in, I'm gonna let them come in one at a time to eat. When dogs eat in the, uh, and member of a group though, they eat in the order of their rank. Who should eat first? This is a question I didn't ask the guardians on camera. This is a trick question, because usually they would say, the older dog. But it's not Tony. The humans should eat something first because they humans are in charge. If you're not going to eat a real meal, just eat something, a chip or a crack or something in five or more small bites. Then I would give Tony permission to eat. And because you're the pup, you get to eat last. And so when Tony's eating, he's not allowed in the play area. So Tony doesn't have to worry about defending his food, even though they don't. But we're just adding structure. And then when Tony's done, he leaves and we invite him in and he gets to eat his food. Now, I would give a command word to each dog to eat using passive training. So when he comes in, maybe his word is uh, feast. So when he takes his first bite of food for two months, you say feast one time when he takes his first bite of food. When he hears the word feast, there's food in his mouth, an association. When he hears the word feast, there's no food in his mouth. It doesn't hold the same association for him. Then when he's done eating, or if he walks away from his bowl, at any point he walks away from his bowl, I pick up the bowl, dump the food out, and put the empty bowl back down. I want them to register and see that the bowl is empty almost all day long, except for those two or three periods, uh, short periods of time when it's feeding time. I know, hang in there, buddy. Mm -hmm. And then when he's done, he has to leave the area. Now, if you pick up the, he walks away, you pick up the bowl and dump it, they usually go and lick their own bowl when you put it back down. Let him lick it, that's fine. Then he leaves the area, then he gets to come in. And if he doesn't want to eat, I don't, I might tell him once or twice the first couple of times, but after a while, he knows. So when he comes in to eat, he's going to, takes his first bite, he hears a different command word. So that way you can actually be feeding them and they will wait outside the dog room. You're watching TV and when it's time you say grub, chow, feast, whatever your words are, and the dog's going to eat on command. This is great because the gate is open. There's food in the bowl. They're restraining themselves. They're developing self-control. And self-control is going to help them in a lot of, with a lot of the behavior problems they have. Now, uh, the guardians may need to, we may need to uh, set up a follow-up session to work on a couple other issues, and I'd like to work with them on uh, loose leash training. If you guys would like to do that, let me know. What I'd like you guys to really do, though, is I can throw a lot at you. I really want you guys to focus on this stuff for the next month or so. I'll give you a call in a week or so to check in. I'll give you a call once we do the write-up to see how things are going. Then I'll call you, or I'll have my assistant call you in a week before my calendar gets too booked up so we can get you on the calendar if you guys want to set something up. But we'll fill, uh, you know, brush up on anything from here as well as do any training stuff that you guys want to cover. All right, um, hey buddy, would you like a treat? <laughs> it's like, no, I'm treated out. I wish I had a camera because that's a pretty cute pose. All right, well this is, uh, and why am I blanking on your name? Bruce. Bruce, that's right. Bruce and Tony, and this is their roadmap to success. Remember, everything you do trains your dog, only sometimes you mean it. Isn't that right, Bruce?